Palestinian. Cease your mewling, boy. It grates my ears. F forgive me. When I saw you awaken, I could not... It was such a relief. We feared you might never wake up. Now, now, Astinian. If Master Alphano thought any less of you, you would still be Nidhogg's plaything. Or dead. I, I, twas but a jest. I thank you, Alphano. And you too, warrior of light. Quite how you managed to persuade Hraesboga to aid in his brood brother's downfall, I cannot imagine. But full glad am I that you did. <clears throat> Yet again, you have achieved the impossible. I, for my part, owe you an apology. When last we met, I did willingly loose an arrow at your heart. Can you forgive me? There is naught to forgive, Hamerick. You but acted in defense of Ishgard, as is your duty. Were you any less single-minded about it, I would not follow you into battle, nor trust you at my back. Besides, I had come to the self-same conclusion that I would have to perish for Nidhogg to be stopped. So let us dispense with the hand-wringing. I have heard enough mewling for one day. Oh! The tendrils of Nidhogg's foul presence bound up every fiber of my being, usurping my senses, but I yet retain some trace of awareness. The worm's mind was as a vast and tumultuous sea. Endlessly its black waters churned, his grief and despair at Ratatoska's murder never calming, never receding. Driven by this surging current came wave upon wave of unrelenting rancor. It was the very image of my own heart. There I saw the dark reflection of the hatred I felt after Nidhogg slew my family. When no path remained save vengeance against Dragonkind. Neither one of us had a choice. But I was blessed with something Nidhogg was not. Comrades and teachers to console and admonish me. Had I not had them to gainsay my obsession, it would surely have consumed me as Nidhogg's did him, and we would have been in all respects alike. Though his shade is banished, his spirit scattered upon the sea of clouds, I feel no joy at his passing. Where once I craved vengeance, I now crave rest. Lord Commander, my hunt is at an end. I would lay down the mantle of Azure Dragoon. My friend. He has tired himself with too many words. 
I doubt not that he will make a full recovery, but he must be allowed some few days of quiet. I too must see my path to its end. Sleep well, my friend. Following the battle with Nidhogg on the steps of faith, Sir Emery called an assembly that he might make his final proclamation as acting head of state. T'was there, with one decree, that the thousand-year rule of the archbishops was ended, paving the way for a new republic. The governance of Ishgard would now be placed in the hands of high and low-born alike, their ranks represented by the newly founded House of Lords and House of Commons. Church was separated from state. The foundation for change had been carefully laid, and the reforms proposed by Ishgard's new government passed into law without incident. His duty done, Emmerich de Borel gladly stepped down from the Archbishop's dais, only to be raised unto the highest seat in the House of Lords. Though he strove at first to refuse this honor, the unexpectedly strident voice of the Count de Durandere left him little choice but to accept. And so it was that the winds of gentle revolution came to stir. Prominent among the many honored guests at Sir Emmerich's investiture were the ambassadors of Dragonkind, a fitting symbol of Ishgard's newfound peace. People looked on in awe as he soared through the heavens on Dragonback, and by their cheers did they hail him an azure dragoon for a new. Thus were the notes of the dragon song rewritten, the din of war giving way to a rising litany of peace and hope.